Meeting of the House Civil Law Committee will come to order. The chair recognizes a quorum. Can I, get, can I have a motion for the minutes from April 16th? 16th. Minutes have been moved. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion passes. First bill on the calendar, House File 1756, as amended. Representative Holberg. Now, members, this is uh, on as amended because we uh, amended it in the last committee we had on it and then laid it over. So we are considering the bill as amended. The amendment, the A1 amendment, is also included in your packets. Representative Holberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. The, um, you may remember that uh, this was the bill that tried to uh, put an end to Ms. Frazier stalking us at every turn for every bill when uh, That's a we had, endeavor. Uh, data change <laughs> classifications to try and protect uh, the data of the participants of the Safe at Home program. And uh, as the bill was before us and amended in the last uh, discussion, um, we proposed that uh, the data would, ex classification, uh, the shielding of the information <coughs> would expire at the time that they were no longer in the program. Uh, there were some concerns from the advocates about that. And so uh, the language that's uh, before you today would uh, make it so that that uh, information would be permanently shielded and uh, we haven't had any pushback from the cities or counties as far as managing that. In fact, it might e actually be easier for them. And uh, other than a brief conversation with Mr. Tennyson, who I don't see in the uh, room, he represents the private data miners and didn't <coughs> know whether or not they had concern. Um, I haven't heard any opposition. Um, this language was posted, I believe, on Monday or Tuesday because this was going to be heard on Wednesday before that meeting was canceled. So the language has been out there. Um, and I don't know if you want to make a blessing from the advocates or whatever there in the room, but I think we have peace in the valley. Um, well, yes. <coughs> um, Representative Holbrook, you're... you're uh Word is good enough for this committee. If people have issues with it, they can uh, approach and ask to be heard on that. But other than that, we're not going to be, uh, ha I guess, taking any comments like that. With it. Oh, you've got your A2 amendment also, right. Representative Holbrook. Okay. Um, and assuming that the, uh, the A2 amendment uh, does what Representative Holbrook had just stated, <clears throat> Uh, in order to get the bill in the shape the author so desires. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion passes. Uh, so House File 1756 as amended with the A2 amendment. Are there any questions for members of the committee? Representative Simon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a reminder to members that uh, today on the House floor we're going to be hearing House File 580. And this bill that we just amended will be added as an amendment well, most of it will be for reasons I'll later explain, but as an amendment to that bill on the House floor. And so from a process standpoint, this hearing allows us to say that it did get a public airing, a public vetting, and no one can say we're making any big change on the House floor without the public having a chance to weigh in. So that's one of the reasons that I understand we're doing this hearing. Thank you, Representative Simon. So then is there any intent um, that this go through and be heard as a... Uh as a standalone bill? Is this the Phyllis Kahn method of putting language in everywhere you possibly can, or is it just going to be uh, satisfied by, by the amendment on the floor today? Are we, do we know that? Well, Representative Holbrook? Mr. Chair, I don't know what the intent of the Senate author is, but my intent always was to fix a problem. I was agnostic as to uh, the process of moving it on the floor, but did want to have the committee process to present the language and have the opportunity for people to put, weigh in on it. So that was the reason for the introduction of the bill and the committee time uh, last week. Uh, so, I mean, it's up to you whether or not you want to move this. It's not, I, I think if everything goes okay, I hear Mr. Tennyson walked in the room, but um, I'm completely uh, uh, happy with putting the amendment on Representative Simon's uh, safe at home bill today and having it move. Okay, thank you. Then, uh, 
Representative Holberg, uh, I will just ask, is there any members of the audience that have an absolute burning desire that they must be heard on this? <laughs> And I don't see anyone jumping to that opportunity. So with that, then um, we will vote on House File 756 in order to uh, make that record clear, Representative Simon, that the committee supports this and it has been heard. Um, Representative Holberg renews her motion that House File 756 as amended be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the committee on rules. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed saying no. Motion passes. Thank you, Representative Holbrook, for your work with this. And thank you uh, to the advocates uh, also on both sides for, for doing the work that you have done on this in order to get it in shape. Next uh, matter on the calendar is House File 1802, Representative Norton. <coughs> Uh, members may recall that on April 16th, um, uh, the day prior, Representative Norton kind of was uh, caught between a rock and a hard place. She was made known of some data practices, issues that affected this uh, particular issue as it was to travel through with the omnibus tax bill regarding the Destination Medical Center. Um, and so a notice was quickly posted for it to go through civil law because it was noticed, noticed by the tax chair. Um, we, we heard it, but there were uh, concerns um, because of the shortness of notice and because of uh, <laughs> members' concerns regarding any bill that comes through this committee with these provisions in it. So Rep. Seven Norton was good enough to um, kind of take this back to the drawing board, uh, bring it up with some people and say, how can we craft this whereby um, it will pass muster for this committee. Um, and it is the chair's intention that this is uh, one of those committee hearings where uh, people are prepared to ask questions um, so we can get to a proper solution for Representative Norton on this. But uh, Representative Norton, if you would, maybe uh, inform the committee on what kind of work has been done uh, between last committee and now. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, after the last committee, I uh, sat down with research and uh, listening to the concerns that some of you had and, and also uh, in studying it further because it was new to me uh, as drafted by the tax uh, department, and a, a great research team, but maybe not data specialists. So uh, they were trying to address the issues that uh, Mayo Clinic, the City of Rochester, and the Destination Medical Center concept had uh, with regard to donors, um, benefactors, people that might want to work with the, the Destination, Destination Medical Center Corporation um, and bring in some private dollars into the, to the mix and how would we deal with that. And so uh, in listening to your comments, we went back to the drawing board and actually found in current law um, the section that's in the amendment before you, which is uh, identical to the treat, its language uh, we've just added uh, to the treatment of Minnesota Zoolog Zoological Gardens, University of Minnesota, Minsky, <laughs> Regional Parks of the Foundation of the Twin Cities and State Services for the Blind. Um, we've added ourselves to that provision. Um, it does protect and I think a reasonable way, at least one that's been acceptable to this body uh, and the state in the past in protecting some private data but also having um, some sun sunshine on who those donors are. And then uh, the rest of the Destination Medical Center Corporation as it, it is drafted in the uh, bill that passed off the House floor yesterday, actually um, the rest of it is all open to the open meeting laws, subject to the open meeting laws. So um, I, we uh, brought uh, Ms. Crandall who was here last time, but she also, uh, we were told to bring her data expert along. So um, we also have uh, some data expertise here as well if you have other questions or concerns or Mr. Chair? Uh, well, thank you, Representative Norton. Uh, so this was language that was offered in the tax committee. Um, and it was withdrawn tax committee in order for us to um, start this conversation here. And I know that you offered this with the intention of it, it kind of being a starting point for discussion, which is good as what we wanted. But um, we have questions from members. Uh, Representative Liebling. Simon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just a little confused about exactly what's before us because what's in our packets is not what I thought this was going to be and um, we've got House Bill 1802 and I thought there was an amendment and this is not what I had seen before so could you just I don't know if I'm missing some piece of paper here that I should have or 
you you know um so here's what happened and and if i can someone maybe correct me if i have this wrong but uh originally on april 16th language was offered uh excluding the dmc from chapter 13. Uh, and there were concerns raised at that in committee. After that, the tax tax committee was was the ne the next day that we were doing markup on the amount of his tax bill. Um, and so Representative Norton wanted to get something in there, uh, and so she offered this language, um, saying that the DMC would be included under private donor gift data exclusions under 13.792, which includes the the new zoo, the U. Uh, Minskew uh, and uh, I because this committee had not considered that language I took it out in tax committee um, and so what we're looking at now is uh, for the purposes of discussion and if folks have ways to tweak this or another way we, we want to go this is the time to do it um, it includes the DMC on that list which would uh, treat that data in the same way as others, so uh, I know we'll get back to you because you're talking reps of leaving. So, Representative Simon. Well, Mr. Chair, I thought that the last hearing was very instructive. I think we got a lot of loud and clear um, testimony from members of this committee about some of their misgivings about the original approach. And I think in this version of House File 1802, we're seeing a reversal, a complete reversal of the presumption, which I think is a, a step in the right direction. It's what this committee seems to have wanted, meaning the other. Uh, Bill basically said um, everything is private except, and this says everything is public except. Mm -hmm. So on the first page of House File 1802, and, and this goes to what I believe was Representative Holberg's um, contention uh, in the first committee we had where she said, I think literally she said something like, look, uh, she can speak for herself better than I can, but she said something like, we have other entities that are that, that are able to straddle this line perfectly well. The University of Minnesota, other public entities, um, where there's a lot more sunshine. And sure enough, that's what Representative Norton has done here by just adding this new Destination Medical Center Corporation to the list of other organizations, including Minsku, the University of Minnesota, the Zoo, and others. And they do it this way as well. And the idea, as I understand it, is everything's public except, and you see the except in items one through five on page one of the bill, and it's things like their prospecting or fundraising lists or strategies or things like that. I don't think anyone, you know, I'm not particularly interested in knowing how the Minnesota Zoo plots to, you know, prospect donors, but we do want to know the, na the names of those donors when they come in. And so that was, I think, the compromise that Representative Horton tried to reach here after hearing the, the committee testimony. So I favor this approach. I think it's a it's a good accommodation, and it, pre and it preserves in here the open meeting law application, of course. That was never an issue, but that's on page two of the bill. So th I think that's really what's before us. And, and just to be clear, um, the parts that were amended out in tax committee did not include the open meeting law provision. So under the out of this tax bill that was passed, um, the DMC is uh, under is does follow the open meeting law, but it's, it's this provision, the data privacy issue. Um, going back to Representative Leveling. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, yeah, the staff that kind of explained to me the reason I was confused is just because there's other language in here that's already been changed in other places. And um, so I was just a little confused about what was before us. But ab absolutely, I uh, yeah, I was I appreciated the chair's indulgence in letting us work this through and letting Representative Norton work this through and. You know, I'm I'm quite comfortable with what we're doing here in terms of data practices. I just had a confusion because there's other language in in what's before us that that's not applicable to what we're doing today. So thank you. Okay. Um, other questions from members? Okay. And we have Representative Scott. Um, before we go to Representative Scott, the the one question I have as the chair, and I know that this was after the last committee. I think Representative Simon, you worked with Representative Norton on this, and maybe Representative Winkler. I can't remember who, but um, we appreciate your efforts on that too. Um, because I think it was it was a good first step. My question is, um, I see the DMC as being qualitatively different from the other entities on this list, um, in that the other entities were pre-existing, uh, originally uh, set up as nonprofits, um, and then they were covered under the umbrella of data practices exclusions for certain specific reasons. This is a new entity. It's being set up 
um, at the behest of a private organization, um, profit or nonprofit, say what you will about it. Um, and I understand the arguments from Mayo would be, but it's for public infrastructure. It just comes, comes down to, to how you look at it. But I do see it as qualitatively different. So um, to the extent that um, the advocates could address that throughout some of the other testimony, I would appreciate that. Representative Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I do have a couple of questions. And um, it, it may slide slightly out of the data practices realm, but this is a new piece of, um, of legislation. And I do have a couple of questions, if that's OK. Um, I looked a little bit at the Zoological Gardens Corporation and compared it to what we have here. And um, I'm just wondering if the board members um, will be subject to statements of economic interest. I know there's a big paragraph here. Well, there's a paragraph starting line 2.34 through 3.4. Um, it talks about conflict of interest. And I think that's a pretty slippery slope. And I'm just wondering if, 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 these, if there's any um, consideration for having some form of statements of economic interest filed so that we make sure that there aren't any conflicts of interest. Representative Norton, did you want to defer to one of your testifiers on that? I will. But, and before I do that, I did want to just clarify something. In the original um, legislation that we have, it was indeed Mayo Clinic who was setting up a private <coughs> nonprofit. In the version that the, the House has passed in taxes, it is the city of Rochester setting up a public nonprofit. Just to clarify, I think you had a, a question about that. And then I'll defer to some folks here. Um, Mr. Chair, <coughs> excuse me, Representative Scott, um, my name is Lynette Slater Crandall, and I serve as uh, Bond Counsel and Economic Development Counsel to Mayo Clinic, and um, would be happy to address the questions. Um, again, in the original bill, um, as Representative Norton indicated, the structure was a little different. The um, DMC public body was actually a political subdivision of the state. It is now a a city established public nonprofit corporation. And so uh, the only provisions that I'm aware of, other than Chapter 317, uh, that would be applicable, I believe, would be specifically in the DMC Act. And so that's where the conflicts of interest language was added to ensure that, um, for example, uh, if there were a city council member or a county board member, uh, who uh, were employed at Mayo Clinic, that that person would be precluded from serving on the board. Um, my understanding is that nonprofit corporations, um, as part of a best practices, and in our ability, for example, as a law firm, to give a uh, an unqualified 501c3 opinion is that they actually also have to have their own conflicts of interest policies in place. And so that allows them to um, maintain their tax exempt status at the, at the federal level and the state level as well. So rather than being statutory, that would be something that, that they would put in place uh, as board members, is my understanding. Representative Scott. Thank you. And as far as the board members, too, um, would spouses, you know, they had give a list of um, folks that are exempt from being board members. Would spouses of those people be eligible then to be on the board? Uh, Ms. Slater Crandall. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Scott, I don't see anything in Subdivision 5 that would preclude that. Um, however, I'd be happy to research whether that's common, again, in conflicts of interest policies that are adopted by nonprofit boards. I know there are standard forms and provisions that are used, um, and we'd be happy to follow up on that for you. I'd appreciate Scott. that. Mr. Chair, I, I, uh, I would. Representative Norton. Yeah, thank you. I would just like to comment on that. You know, Mayo Clinic employs tens of thousands of people. Uh, and a good percent of the employees live in our community. And it would be extremely hard to find somebody that doesn't have a father, mother, spouse, or child that works at Mayo Clinic. So um, I would just you know, keep that in mind as you're, you're thinking this through. We, we definitely didn't want city council members, for instance, that were employees of Mayo to be serving on this board. We wanted to exempt them out. But I think we, we start down a, a very dangerous path trying to find uh, a member in our community that doesn't have a fairly close relative that doesn't work with Mayo or in perhaps even one of the businesses that might be affected. It, that's our community. So, Well, if I could, Representative Norton, that's part of the rub in this whole mm -hmm. situation. If Rochester is a company town, then um, normally it's the company that takes care of this stuff. And in this case, it's the company uh, wanting to perform certain actions under the guise of state authority. 
uh, which I think many people are willing to do because mayo is valued. Uh, but normally in those situations, they would do it on their own. Um, and now doing it through the, uh, the conduit of state, uh, state authority, there's all these other factors that come in uh, because people get nervous about whether or not it sets a precedent. Um, so that, that will be my ongoing concern. But Representative Scott, or did you want to respond to that, Ms. Slater Crandall? Yeah, Mr. Chair, if I might, um, if I could just um, remind members that even though the structure of the DMC Corporation is that of a public nonprofit corporation, what it really is is similar to any other economic development authority that you might have in your community, uh, an HRA, an EDA, or a port authority. And so the projects that it will be undertaking are the same. Um, we're talking about public infrastructure, streets, sewers, traffic lights, um, land acquisition, uh, site remediation, those types of things. But um, we actually have a chart that we've prepared and it shows exactly how the powers and the projects that can be undertaken uh, by the DMC uh, match up with other, again, similar entities in the state of Minnesota. So none of the funding will be going directly to Mayo Clinic to build any structure that Mayo Clinic will be building. That's the, the um, $3.5 billion private investment that's been discussed. Mayo will be building its own buildings, but to the extent that additional infrastructure uh, that would be owned by the city or the DMC Corporation would be necessary to facilitate that private investment, as well as other private investment, we anticipate biomedical research, uh, office parks, new hotels, new restaurants, um, other facilities that would be funded with private investment. The DMC dollars, the public dollars, and the city and the county dollars will be spent on the public infrastructure. Ms. Slater Crandall, thank you for that. I, I think probably a lot of members of the committee understand that, but we're sort of dancing around a, a fiction here, um, and that's not a pejorative term. Uh, it's being created for this specific purpose. Is if Mayo, this is absolutely at the at the behest of Mayo. I don't think anyone um, is going to dispute that, um, and and I don't think people in particular have a problem with that. Um, but in this case, um, Mayo now wants. I mean, they, there there is a port authority or a economic development authority in Rochester. Why couldn't that have been used? Well, I can tell you, Rips of Norton, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, the focus of the Destination Medical Center is on a very specific purpose, not citywide, not countywide, which is what our Economic Development uh, Corporation focuses on. This is focused on a very narrow um, uh, topic, and you know that's the primary uh, difference. This will be focused on the Destination Medical Center uh, area and its particular projects, not, not economic development broadly. <clears throat> Ms. Slater Crandall, why was the decision made to to change this from a uh, private nonprofit entity to uh, a a public entity? Or I don't know who someone said that that was changed. Maybe that was you, Representative Norton. Uh, the tax committee did that. Okay. Mr. Chair, um, Ms. Slater Crandall, I can say that substantively, um, again, the powers of the DMC Corporation and the projects that it can undertake are the same. But again, in, instead of it being a political subdivision, actually, uh, it's it's a public nonprofit established by um, by the city. And I agree with Representative Norton that we're not exactly sure the, the rationale, but, but for some reason um, the, the tax committee thought it was beneficial to establish it as a, as a nonprofit. Well, I understand the characterization now. I was, I, when you said that, I had thought you that it originally, um, prior to the original legislation, that there was thought of this being um, a, a private nonprofit that would have been controlled um, I mean, a lot more directly from Mayo, which I think probably from any economic development uh, engineer's perspective would have been more desirable. Reps of Norton. Well, I would say uh, th this was changed. It was part of the, the, the tax committee's proposal. And I will tell you part of where that came from was uh, constituents in Rochester. The tax chair came to Rochester to uh, several hundred people in a, in a room and heard their concerns. And their concerns were some of the same concerns that you have is oversight. This is state money, and it will be a considerable amount of city and county tax dollars and they wanted to make sure that the city and county and elected officials had control over that those funds and not a private entity so that the, the tax chair heard those concerns um, you know worked with her staff and and uh, this is where we're at today and I will also say mr. chair that the uh, 
everything that the Destination Medical Center Corporation, as drafted in this bill, comes up with those plans and how they're going to spend the money, all of it will, will uh, have to be approved by the City Council, uh, a body of elected officials in the community, before any action is taken. Thank you. Rep. Scott. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. And as I was reading again with the Zoological Gardens Corporation, I noticed that um, their officers, directors, and employees were all state employees. Is that going to be the case with this entity? Ms. Slater Crandall? Um, uh, Mr. Chair and Representative um, Scott, I'm sorry, so the question is, will the employees of the DMC Corporation be state employees? Correct. Um, I am not aware that that will be the case. Um, again, they would be employees of the public nonprofit corporation. And so is it a question of, of benefits or other rights or obligations of state employees that you would be questioning? Representative Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, all of that. Um, I, I just, you know, I don't feel that this fits into a, a scope of something that uh, where these people should be state employees. And uh, I would just like to get it on record that they're not going to be if that's if somebody can give me that reassurance. Um, Ms. Slater Crandall. Mr. Chair and Representative Scott, we'll be happy to confirm that. Again, that was never the intent when the proposal was put together. Again, when it was put together as a political subdivision of the state, all of the provisions that would be applicable to um, uh, employees of political subdivisions would have applied to the DMC. Uh, employees. I, I can add, um, Mr. Chair and Representative Scott, that I don't believe at this point, of course, the DMC Corporation will have to make this determination, but I don't believe that the thought is that they will have a, a massive staff. While this is a massive undertaking and this is a special purpose entity, um, just like others we create in the state to undertake very specific projects, actually smaller projects that occur over a much shorter period of time, um, my, my presumption is that um, the DMC Corporation will be working with consultants, professionals in the industry that have the, the skills and the ability to put together a, a long-range plan like this. There are municipal financial advisors, consulting firms, etc., that that do this work, that get hired by entities like our sports facilities authorities and our other, you know, our watershed districts, etc., to put together um, plans for these types of massive public infrastructure projects. Rep. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, I, I would like to see some language um, that spouses wouldn't be allowed to be, because they would have a material financial interest. So I, I would, I would like to see language specifically in this, you know, amended onto here, you know, whether it's on the floor or whatever. I guess I can offer the amendment, but that spouses be added to that. And I understand, Representative Norton, what you're saying that you know it's going to be hard maybe to find those people, but I think it's really important that we do um, find the people that, that you know that don't have some sort of material interest in, in what takes place on this board and within this entity. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Representative Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess, you know, as far as the conversation has, how it's gone, I look at this and I look at the entities that are in this private donor, into this existing bill, and they are all state organizations. So now we're taking something that, doesn't quite fit with the rest of these folks and sliding it in there. And I, I have a hard time with when you do have an EDA, when you do have a Port Authority, when you have that type of organization already existing, and you're saying that this is a narrower scope, I find it hard to believe that that whole area of Rochester and the surrounding communities aren't going to benefit from this targeted project. So in that, yeah, it's a targeted project, I would beg to differ that it doesn't fall into the scope of an EDA or a port authority. So, because I believe that that's what they're there for. They're there to provide that infrastructure for these types of projects. So, I'm not inclined to support this type of a process. Could um, maybe maybe someone could explain? Um, and we do have another testifier at the table who has int introduced herself. Um, could you please introduce yourself for the record, ma'am? Um, yes, my name is Sherry Aberly. I'm a partner in the trial group at Dorsey and Whitney, uh, here on behalf of the Mayo with Ms. Cr at Ms. Crandall's request. Okay. Um, with some expertise in the Data Practices Act. Okay, thank you. Um, if one of the testifiers could explain, um, I'm not sure if this is your wheelhouse or not, Ms. Aberly or Ms. Slater Crandall, but. Uh, uh, 
why couldn't this entity uh, be created under the existing legislation that we have for uh, economic development authorities or or port authorities, but just um, uh, with with a new designation or boundaries? Was that um, the exact intent of the original legislation before the tax committee changed it? Would it would it have fallen under that statute, or was it uh, still an independent creation? Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Howe, um, under uh, Chapter 469, you are correct that cities can establish uh, housing and redevelopment authorities, uh, port authorities, and um, economic development authorities. There is an EDA in the city of Rochester. However, that EDA has a much broader mission than just ensuring that the state of Minnesota, uh, with the specific location being the city of Rochester, actually downtown Rochester, being uh, established as a true global destination for medical care. Uh, that's the singular focus here of, of this new entity that's being created. Um, we prepared and presented um, with the city an infrastructure master plan that shows the um, order of magnitude of the investment that will occur in the city of Rochester to realize this vision. Um, it's actually much greater than the $585 million worth of investment in public infrastructure. Um, the public infrastructure cost estimates at this time, based on work with consultants, is actually closer to $1.5 billion. Um, the city is putting in some of that funding, of course, in addition to what's mandated in the House bill now. Just through the regular city um, capital investment plan program, it's $339 million, as well as other sources of funding, um, federal sources, um, MnDOT funding that's available for certain um, uh, projects. And this is a huge undertaking. Um, we're not aware that anything like this has been done on this scale uh, in the country in the last several years. Um, uh, there have been um, similar efforts in Cleveland to um, uh, create this type of uh, public investment, private investment, and, and excitement around a community and building a community around the medical center and related business industries. But the city of Rochester's EDA um, has a broader mission. And quite frankly, what we've heard from legislators is that they want to make sure that these state dollars are spent specifically to support the DMC mission, that they don't get diverted for a wastewater project across town that really isn't very directly tied to a very specific development plan that supports the DMC mission. Um, again, in, in Minnesota, we create these types of special service or special purpose entities, special service districts for all types of projects. Um, or when we undertake a project like building a sports facility, um, that's a massive undertaking, but that's one building that gets construction over, constructed over three years. We're talking about massive public investment. Uh, again, the scope being close to a, a billion and a half dollars worth of public infrastructure over 20 years. And we think that merits a, a special purpose body with state representation, which is what the DMC Corporation would have. So, Ms. Slater Crandall, why can't you create another one then? Leave the Rochester EDA intact, but create another one specifically with the boundaries intent and intent that you want. I know other cities have the same thing. St. Paul, we have a Port Authority, but we also have community development corporations uh, and other types of entities. Why can't you just create another one under the same statute? Uh, Mr. Chair and, and Representative Howe, again, because the, the powers, while, while they line up and, and the project costs are similar, um, there's not the, the, the specific focus of, um, of the, the DMC initiative and the ability to really um, tailor it that narrowly to a specific focus. So for example, with a, a housing and redevelopment authority, uh, development plans with certain um, findings need to be made. We have set up a separate set of findings. We've tried to mirror that in every way we can, that it's a development plan that's adopted after a public hearing that gets approved by the city for consistency with its comprehensive plan. But there are enough differences that the existing rules um, would be too constraining, I believe, to, to establish this type of entity for this purpose. Well, Ms. Slater-Crandall, here's my question. You, you could have taken 
the uh, enabling legislation for EDAs or port authorities and tweaked it to create exactly what you wanted. But instead, uh, you went from the other direction. Um, and now we're trying to kind of patch those taxpayer protections and citizen protections on top of this. And I'm wondering why you didn't start from the side that said, okay, this is, uh, this is a CDC or an EDA or a Port Authority or something, but it's within these boundaries and for this purpose. Why didn't you do that? Mr. Chair, um, I actually feel that is what we did. <laughs> um, we actually started with the Port, Port Authority Act and I joke with, um, with our author and our, our entire team that's worked on this project, including the city, that there wasn't a lot of original drafting here. We started with, I, I literally did a cut and paste of the Port Authority Act and tweaked that. So essentially what we have is what's in 469 for a Port Authority and with certain changes, um, again, tailoring it to the DMC mission and, and goals. Um, to, to essentially look like a political subdivision of the state, just like a port authority. Um, what the House uh, did in, in their amendments was to actually call it a city-established public nonprofit corporation. Um, and whether you view that as a distinction without a difference or not, um, I, I think is up to you. But again, the powers and the projects are still the same. So if you look at how the entity lines up with a port authority, that's, that's exactly where we started with this legislation. Okay. okay. Uh, other questions or somehow? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, I think you went down where I was going, so okay. thank you. Thank you. Rep. Scott. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is hopefully a data question so that you didn't make a wasted trip over here. <laughs> um, if a group of people who don't want their names to be listed as donors for this, if they form like an LLC or something and donate in the name of the LLC, will that be allowable? There's a couple of decisions that have been reached. Ms. Aberly, sir. Oh, sorry. Sherry Aberly, um, <coughs> Madam Chair. Um, there are a couple of decisions that have been addressed this, and we were looking very closely at uh, things that were analogous to that situation. And our understanding is, and of course it would depend to some extent on uh, contractual language and those sorts of things, but I think the expectation, the understanding based on decisions that have been reached by the Minnesota Court of Appeals and IPAT are that those names would be disclosed, notwithstanding donors' desire to have their names withheld and be anonymous. Thank you. Representative Scott? Okay. Um, so on that line, Ms. Averly, uh, what exactly then would be disclosed under the current uh, proposal? Well, under the current proposal, um, it is the information, it's exactly what you have in the statute. It exempts out certain data, and that is the intention. So you would have... Um, names of donors and the gift ranges that become public data, but then the other information would remain private such that uh, that information would not be disclosed to the public. And that is, uh, I think, one of the questions that you raised earlier, suggesting a distinction between the entities that are already listed and this authority. Uh, the thing that makes them very similar is that, unlike some of the other entities that you've been discussing today, this is an entity that will garner um, a lot of private donations, a lot of private donations that will be an essential and necessary for the project that will ultimately benefit the public over time. And so that is why it's important to have the, uh, the entity added. So, Ms. Averly, then, for the, the names and the levels of gifts, are you just going to have um, a name and then the range being from $5 to $10 million, Or how many levels would you have? I don't know how they will set that up ultimately, and, and Ms. Crandall may have a better idea of what the levels that will be. Ms. Crandall? Um, Mr. Chair, um, I, I note that in the existing law, it simply provides for gift ranges without any parameters for, for bracketing. Um, I certainly don't think that would be the intent of, of the DMC Corporation to, to do so, and I presume if they tried to do something like that, that this body would decide that that would not be acceptable, that the data would somehow have to be meaningful. But there's certainly no guidance currently in um, Section 13.792 that specifies what the ranges have to be. Okay. Ms. Aberly? If I could just add to that, I think there's typically, I mean, if you look at 
the disclosures made by many other nonprofits, there are kind of common gift ranges that you would find there um, that, have, that are acceptable and, and probably similarly looking to how the Minnesota Zoo, Minskew, and those sorts of entities disclose that information would provide appropriate guidance. So can you testify today um, that that would be um, what we would likely see? Because um, as you stated, uh, Ms. Crandall, that this committee might have problems with it, but we're considering it right now without knowing. So, Ms. Crandall? Uh, Mr. Chair, I could, I could tell you with complete confidence that if I were engaged by the DMC Corporation to advise them, on um, this data practices issue with the advice of, of my partner, Ms. Averly here, uh, I think we would suggest ranges again that are customary in the nonprofit community. When you get the annual report, um, giving report of some of your favorite charities that you give to, you'll, you'll see, I think again, common um, bands of, of giving and, and we would certainly suggest that, that uh, we look at a, a, a norm of what's common in the industry and and suggest that to the DMC Corporation. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Ms. Crandall? I, I might just add to, um, I, I know one thing that this, um, th this committee's kind of touched on today with a couple of the members' questions is again, the similarity of the DMC Corporation to these other entities that are listed in 13.792. Um, I work with cities and counties all across the state and, and in other states in the country as well. And one thing that is really unique about this initiative is that even though it's a public body, um, public bodies aren't usually um, finding themselves in a situation where they have a, a potential donor base excited about uh, the projects that they're undertaking, um, building the streets and the sewers and all the important things that my governmental clients do. Um, but this entity, this DMC public entity, really is unique, I think, in that it can leverage uh, this unique relationship with Mayo Clinic and the opportunity in the city of Rochester to generate some excitement about investment from the private sector. And so, like the zoo, um, like the U of M with its, um, its alums, um, some of these other entities that uh, are able to leverage their mission, their charitable purposes, uh, to, to get private support. I think that's, that's why our DMC is similar to these entities. Unlike a city port authority or um, a county board, again, who does very important work, but, but again, probably doesn't generate that level of, of enthusiasm from the private sector. So they're uh, taking out their checkbooks or um, you know, putting them in their estate planning. Ms. Crandall, none of the other entities uh, on this list under 13792 um, had come to the legislature and said um, we need what well, the original request was would have been a billion dollars over, over 30 years for a 3.5 billion dollar investment um, we need data privacy for our private donors if we don't have that we can't do it we can't build the U we can't build the zoo we can't well now I understand those are old before data privacy laws however um, this is a very different situation so how much private money do you need to build this and um, why, why can't it happen? What money are you not going to get that makes it impossible to do this deal uh, if we don't pass this and how much will it be? Um, Mr. Chair, um, I, I can't give you a specific dollar amount, but what I can tell you is that in the research that's been conducted over the last two and a half years, um, an ability to leverage private donations has been identified. I can tell you that in the infrastructure, uh, public infrastructure plan uh, that was put together with the city that I referenced, which was provided to the tax committee, uh, there is actually a funding gap of 155 um, $155 million that is unfunded at this point over the 20-year plan. Um, costs will change. This is just an estimate intended to be an order of magnitude. But to be quite honest, I don't know why the state of Minnesota or the city of Rochester would want to leave the possibility of, of one dime uh, not going into this project if it might be available on the table. And so, again, while I can't tell you that there are firm commitments out there, the, the research that's been conducted has, has shown that there's an opportunity. It's not thousands of dollars. Um, it's, it's millions of dollars. 
And again, I think uh, the, the city, uh, our authors, and some other members that we've talked to have um, supported that ability to try to leverage private funds, and that will certainly be, I, I think, uh, and it's listed in the legislation uh, as one of the undertakings of the DMC to go out and try to, to garner this private investment. Okay. Well, and thank you. Not a lot of people in this community, I think, hang out and have coffee with individuals that can, that can write a $3 million check. But there are other folks who do. I'm sure they know the game plan better than us, hence, hence the questions. It's not, I think, relatively understood. Representative uh, Holbert. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And how are you funded so far? I mean, you have a logo. Somebody's paying your salary or sponsoring activities. Um, at the Yacht Club in Chicago. Where, where is this money coming from? Ms. Crandall. Right now? Um, Mr. Chair uh, and Representative Holberg, um, I'm retained by Mayo Council. Um, uh, excuse me, Mayo, the Mayo Clinic. Uh, the City Council obviously has put staff and resources into this project. Um, uh, so those two entities on their own, the county has uh, time into this project as well. Um, so um, that is currently how, how the initiatives uh, are being funded. Again, moving forward, the DMC Corporation will be a public entity that will have to fund its own admin and operating costs, um, which you know, isn't clearly delineated currently in the legislation. I think the intent is that that funding would come from the, the local communities, but um, that's, again, another source of of where the private dollars could go is to fund admin and operating costs. It's, it's anticipated that there will be an international marketing effort as well to bring um, patients, to bring practitioners, to bring other businesses to the city of Rochester. And so um, those costs will all have to be funded um, somehow. And, and again, the private donor dollars would be one source of that funding. Mr. Chair, do you, I mean, there's a logo out there. Is there, is there a structure? That's the DMC now, or is that logo just kind of hanging out there that somebody designed and we don't really have a DMC as of yet? Um, Ms. Gretel. Mr. Chair and Representative Holberg, um, right now there is no formal entity that is the DMC. The DMC is the, um, the name under which the informal partnership between Mayo Clinic, the city, and the county um, have been operating, but there's no existing public or private structure. Again, uh, Mayo Clinic as an entity, again, has undertaken research and done its own strategic planning. Um, this is consistent with the city's master uh, development plan for the downtown district, but these, these three entities have been working together, but there, there is no corporate uh, public or private entity that is essentially the DMC today. Representative <laughs> Norton. I would just say, uh, Additionally, uh, DMC is a concept right now. The Destination Medical Center, we talk about it as a community or as a Destination Medical Center corporation uh, at some point. That's what our hope is. Um, so, so it is a philosophy that, that is actually a public-private philosophy and a partnership in our community. So as Ms. Crandall mentioned, there's uh, the city, the county, the Mayo Clinic, there's also the Chamber of Commerce and citizens that are in, in involved in this and supportive of it. So that, that concept is there. And in addition to that, uh, the, the community voted to extend our sales tax uh, last November, and in that was $20 million to go toward the Destination Medical Center effort. So that has already been voted on by the citizens of Rochester. Representative Holbert. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Liebling. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and members, and um, I pre really appreciate this discussion. This is very important because um, uh, I just want to sort of step back and, and say that, um, you know, we have really important interests here, and our challenge as a legislature is to figure <coughs> out how do we balance these interests. And in this particular uh, project that we're talking about, we have to consider Obviously, Mayo Clinic's interest, which is where this um, began, because Mayo came to us saying that if they're going to continue to compete and, uh, and continue to grow and continue to be the economic engine that they have been for the state, that they need us to participate in certain ways. But we also have the city's interest as, as a city, as a public entity, and the citizens that um, Representative Norton and I and others represent, and their interests may be 
at times the same as Mayo's and at times perhaps not. So there's important interest to be balanced. Thirdly, of course, there's a state's interest in all of this. So all of this governance, I'm so glad that this is getting a full airing and discussion because these are things that even Representative Norton and I, as much as we are concerned about Mayo's growth, continued growth and development, we are also trying to balance these things. So um, I'm saying this kind of off of some discussion that was had a while back here about um, uh, financial, about conflict of interest. Okay, um, when we talk about conflict of interest, we're usually talking, I think, about somebody making decisions that are going to impact themselves personally, uh, usually their financial interest. I want to remind people, first of all, that Mayo employees are salaried employees. And so anybody who's an employee of Mayo or a family member of Mayo, however distant, is going to have an interest in Mayo and in how well Mayo does in the, in the simple way that any of us will have an interest in a business in our community. And I think that interest is the same interest that the state has. We all have a stake in Mayo's growth and development. Um, so I do think that when this project started off, and I, I, I think I'm going to be saying this for the first time publicly, I had some real concerns about the way it was structured. Because I felt that it was too much tilted toward Mayo's interest. Um, and, and to a very large degree, we share Mayo's interest as a city and as a state. But not entirely. I, I really feel that when we're talking about public funding, it's really important that we have appropriate control by public entities. And that we have, of course, transparency to the greatest degree possible. And that we have appropriate data practices. And so th th I'm kind of... Um, Going back to Representative Scott's comment about, about spouses, and she's concerned about spouses. Um, it, when we, again, when we talk about who has an interest here, I think it's really important that I'm, I'm not so worried about people representing Mayo's interest, what I, because we all do in a large sense. If we weren't concerned about Mayo's interest, we wouldn't be hearing this proposal at all. I'm more concerned that we have people who are making decisions who can represent, appropriately represent the city's interest and the state's interest to the degree that those interests may be different at various times. Um, and and um, I think that may come down to a lot of this transparency issue, just to make sure that when we have donors, that those donors are not using their economic power to inappropriately benefit themselves in some of the development that gets done. So um, um, I guess I'm just, um, it, really all this comes down to who gets to make the decisions in the end. And I think where we've gotten to with this proposal is one that is, um, although it's, it's been a little rough getting here, and, and I'm, I'm glad we have this extra real vetting today, because a lot of it comes down to who gets to make the ultimate decision. The way the bill is now, the city council gets to make the ultimate decision. And <clears throat> as all of you know, just because we're elected officials doesn't mean that we're free of conflict either. We all have our, we all come in with, from wherever we come from. But if we're going to go down this road, as we have in this legislature, of doing things as a state to help and benefit private entities, we're all going to have these concerns at one time or another. And I'm pretty comfortable right now with where we are with the proposal because it ultimately is under the decision-making authority of the city council. And um, so I, I just wanted to kind of put that out there for all of you and just to let you know that um, I really do appreciate the very thorough vetting that this proposal is getting today because the citizens of Rochester have a real interest in that and the entire state does as well. And I think that people are... Um, in Rochester, some people may have been concerned that this was moving too quickly, and it, it did move very quickly. I think people understood the importance of this proposal, but we should never move so quickly that we um, forget the interests of the citizens of the state of Minnesota, especially when we're dealing with, um, sometimes as, as the chair mentioned, people who may be very much out of our league in their economic power. 
and that we keep control as a legislature of issues like transparency and ultimate decision making and make sure that the citizens of Minnesota are ultimately the ones who get to decide what happens with our economic development. So thanks for indulging me. Thank you for those comments, Representative Liebling, uh, as well. Um, I, I, too, part of my concern was the level of speed at which this moved. Um, and I think as far as the uh, the one percenters in Minnesota, um, anyway, who are used to uh, moving at the speed of business, um, when all of a sudden they run into the speed of government, they see a very different thing. Unless, of course, you own a professional sports team, which <laughs> takes uh, anywhere from seven to 25 years to, to get uh, a new stadium or some funding as we've seen around here. This one was just introduced this session um, at roughly the same level or more, which would I think be the largest investment the state has ever made um, in uh, an entity that benefited a private uh, for-profit um, outfit. So um, my question related to what you said, uh, Representative Leaving, is you said that it would be under the authority of the city council. I think I recall the first tax committee on this, there was a, a Rochester City Council member who, who testified um, about how great this would be for Rochester, but we did not find out until after the fact that that city council member was an employee of Mayo Clinic, um, which many people afterwards thought, well, wait a second, <laughs> shouldn't you have disclosed that up front? I mean, that to us is the crux of, of conflict of interest. Um, for some people, um, that that line is far uh, easier to tread than it is for others. And for a lot of people, they said you, you would suggest, oh, this is clearly to my benefit because I, I get to keep my job. Well, I'm going to keep my job anyway. I mean, it's, it really goes nowhere. I, I believe in Mayo Clinic. I believe in what they're doing. It has nothing to do with whether or not I'm advocating for it because I'm an employee of it. But for others, um, it could impact. And, of course, the dollar level is a factor there as well. So... You see it because you live in Rochester. The only thing that many of, of us see is, is examples like that, where someone comes in and, and testifies, this is great. Well, wait a second, your employee, is it a conflict of interest? So, um, Representative Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This, the the uh, bill here, it, it uh, says the, you said the DMCC is a concept. It hasn't been organized yet. Um, f formally organized. Uh, it's not a legal entity yet. Uh, and so it says here that it was initially going to be a nonprofit, but now it's going to be a political subdivision. Ms. Crandall. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Allen, um, what, what we call the DMC initiative right now, again, is, is simply a partnership of um, Mayo Clinic, the City Council, the county, and as Representative Norton indicated, a lot of other community partners. Um, there have been numerous public forums held and, and input taken, but ultimately what the, what the public entity will be that will be responsible for selecting uh, public infrastructure projects and spending the public dollars. Uh, it was originally proposed in Representative Norton's bill that it would be a political subdivision of the state of Minnesota. However, <coughs> in the House tax bill, it was changed to be a public nonprofit corporation established by the city, and so that's how it currently stands a public nonprofit corporation, but again, the projects and the powers are the same. Rips it, okay, so the, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so what law is it going to be organized under? So is there is there a city, um, it's a city nonprofit, so does the city have a statute, that uh, nonprofit Ms. statute? Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Allen, it will be organized under the nonprofit law of the state. It's Chapter 317 or 317A, I believe. Excuse me, I'll have to look at the reference here. Um, but, but there is a nonprofit chapter. It's 317A. Um, Representative Allen, if you look at line 2.9, uh, it specifies that um, the city will establish the DMC Corporation as a nonprofit under Chapter 317A. Rips of Allen. Mr. Chair. Uh, so, I mean, I understand the concern. The concern was that, okay, if you, if you were to organize this under, uh, as a municipality or some sort of uh, a political subdivision where it was a, it's similar to the city where the city is constrained by that it can only it can it can hold funds uh, private funds, but that it can only expend those funds for a public purpose, and so then you have a but then you you have a nonprofit here that 
is it, it does the nonprofit then give you um, more flexibility as far as the purposes so that that we will have I mean it's my understanding that it can be something much broader than I mean and maybe it's all public purpose but but it but is you know with the corporation um, you know you'll there'll be a fiduciary duty um, and 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 so but 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 as far as you know accepting discriminatory trusts or or um, expanding it for that may not necessarily be a public I mean it's it's clear with municipalities under the law what is public expenditures but I'm not certain it's so clear with a nonprofit and so that do you have the same protections are you comfortable saying that that the law of governing nonprofits is going to impose as uh, stringent standards on what is public what is a public expenditure versus a, a municipality or a Ms. Graham. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Allen, um, because the the powers and the the um, projects that can be funded is not more expansive um, as as the bill has been modified by the House, the entity structure is different. It's it's my opinion that that no that that the um, the public funds would still need to be expended for public purposes consistent with um, other statutory constraints in the Minnesota Constitution. We're still talking about public dollars here from the general fund that have to be expended for a public purpose. And, and to be quite honest, again, I, I'm not certain why the, the House um, Tax Committee decided that the public nonprofit structure was preferable. Um, I, again, I deal on a daily basis with political subdivisions of the state, but because none of the um, other powers are more expansive uh, and, and the, project, the, the project list is restricted, I think that those, um, those concepts that are generally applicable to, as you indicate, other municipalities would apply here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Holberg. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I don't know if Representative Liebling or Norton but uh, the last time I saw this bill, the deed was the agency that would approve the bonding. You talked about the final authority, but doesn't deed have some approval authority as well? Ms. Grant, or was, who was that question for? <coughs> Either Rep. Uh, Norton or Liebling or? Rep. Norton. Well, and council may want to weigh in here. Originally, the bill was written so that the state would bond. Um, now the bill is written that I believe uh, we talked about the Department of Revenue I think it did end up in the Department of Economic Development will uh, decide when the trigger has been met for the state for the funds to be able to be used and matched by the city and county um, so this bill has changed throughout the process um, from what from what we originally wrote and I don't know if Ms. Crandall wants to but if I might Representative Holberg Deed has approval authority before certain portions of this move forward. Is that correct? So, yes. just a uh, editorial comment: When you have Deed sponsoring social events in excess of twenty thousand dollars in cost, with Mayo paying for it, and then months later. Deed's going to be the one that, you know, turns the red light on for the money to start flow. I'm not so sure that that's not a conflict as well. Thank you, Representative Holberg. Um, Representative, well, actually, uh, before Representative Scott, uh, maybe Ms. Crandall can, can answer this. Um, on lines 2.19 uh, to 2.21, it allows for, on this uh, entity, Two representatives of the medical business entity as defined in 46940. That's in the uh, the overall bill, as I understand it. <laughs> what is the what is the medical entity defined under 46940? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, the medical business entity is is essentially defined um, by location of the business and size, and so it it essentially is Mayo Clinic. Um, and that uh, that would be the only entity that would qualify currently as a medical business entity uh, under the definition. So, uh, Ms. Crandall, in this list um, under uh, Section 1, 
that allows for the DMC to be placed on the list with the zoo and the U of M and Minskew, do any of those other boards um, allow for uh, members to be appointed by one specific business or corporation? Uh, Mr. Chair, I can tell you that um, that I am not aware of that with respect to any of these particular entities. I, I haven't reviewed their board structure. I will tell you, though, in Minnesota statute, it is not uncommon for stakeholders, essentially, to be placed on uh, advisory or decision-making boards, as so long as they would not constitute a majority, um, that would be permissible under the Constitution. So we will often have, for example, we, we came up with a laundry list, and, and I apologize, I don't have that with me, but for example, um, I know in the Department of Natural Resources, for example, uh, there are entities that are formed to uh, make decisions uh, about projects and funding where the stakeholders are represented on those boards. Uh, Rep. Seven Norton. Um, I also would point out, uh, and I, this just I just noticed this. This is uh, this portion of the bill. Originally, the portion that we thought you would want to discuss was just on page the first page, but they put the whole this whole section in, and it was amended uh, in uh, the la in, uh, on, uh, wasn't on the floor, so it must have been a Ways and Means um, on line 2.22, where it has two represent two representatives from a city business, you know, and out of five. Uh, nominated by the area chamber, it is now one and a second one from the Southeast Labor Council. So uh, it actually designates two different uh, designating bodies to give those five names to the city council from which they choose one. Well, I'm, uh, I'm assuming, and I don't know this, but I'm assuming part of the resistance, uh, Reps of Norton, was in comparison to, say, for example, um, the uh, IRRRB. And I am not aware. Uh, now that's that's different because it's got its its own commissioner. But are there any members of the IRRRB? I don't have any Rangers on this committee. I don't think who uh, who are appointed directly by mining interests or a specific mining company. Mr. Chair, Norton? we heard this bill this year, and I believe it is now uh, has been passed on to the governor in our uh, tax conformity bill at the very beginning of the year. There are no they took off all private entities on their IRRRB. It's now just legislators. But, but there were at one point? There were, and I don't know who made those decisions. There were three, I believe, three community members, business representatives. Okay. Uh, Representative Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you mentioned that you would be, um, of course, uh, doing an international search for, for donations and those sorts of things, um, a drive for that. And one of the things that concerns me in light of the world that we live in right now is that we have many enemies across the globe. And I just wonder if there are any assurances, if there's anything, you know, I don't know if this is going to be written in the fine print somewhere, but I just want to be assured that, that folks that are enemies of our country um, are not going to be um, contributing to, to this, that we would make a pledge not to take money from those entities. Um, I, I just see... I guess I'll just let you answer that. Um, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Crandall, if you wanted to respond to that. Mr. Chair and Representative Scott, um, actually, I, I believe my reference to the, to the international campaign was in respect of, of marketing um, as well as um, searches for, for talent as well, recruiting um, physicians and other qualified staff uh, to the Mayo area. Um, I believe, Mr. Chair, that we may have somewhere in statute already prohibitions on on um, receipt of funding for certain purposes <coughs> from certain countries. I'm trying to recall where I ran across this recently. Um, again, I don't, I don't know that the, that the donor search um, would be targeted at um, uh, any specific um, international base. Um, I presume that, you know, again, Mayo Clinic would be lending some of its experience and expertise with its existing donor base to the extent that those individuals had indicated an interest or, or um, uh, some excitement around the DMC initiative. Um, but, but certainly, even as this um, exemption is, um, is drafted, uh, the names would be available, and I presume then, um, you know, additional information could probably be obtained to the extent that it's it's readily available, um, otherwise publicly available. 
Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions from members? So I'll tell members uh, my intention right now. The chair um, has uh, enduring reservations about this um, because of what I've stated. Um, but I, I think we've exhausted the questions that the committee has, um, and I suspect based on the question and the language as proposed in 1802 would pass. I would state that in light of the questions answered by uh, uh, Ms. Crandall regarding, um, well, from, from Ms. Norton, uh, or Representative Norton regarding um, the IRRRB, um, there's no way that I personally would have ever voted for private um, representation, exclusive private representation to a, from a certain company on a public board. Um, but it has existed in our, in our state before, um, and I understand some of uh, some rules may be bent in order to make this happen. So. Um, unless there are any other questions, it's my intention that uh, Representative Liebling moves that House File 1802 be recommended to pass and re referred to the Committee on Rules. Uh, is there any other discussion on that? Okay, seeing none, then that is the motion. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed say no. No. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Norton. Oh, there being no other business before the committee, uh, we are adjourned.